Good evening all and welcome, I'm Steve McKinney. Tonight, we sit and we talk with the nation's chief executive, Prime Minister the Right Honorable Perry Gladstone Christie, and tonight we're looking at the state of affairs of the nation. Of course, Prime Minister, we're privileged that you are able to stop by and talk with us this evening. We want to welcome you to the show tonight, and thank you so much for consenting. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here, and obviously this is the beginning of a new year and a very defining period Absolutely. in our country. Absolutely. Well, Prime Minister, let us begin by talking about something that's on everybody's mind. You know and I know that, of course, value at tax is the biggest thing that everybody is talking about, and they sort of question why value at tax. Why did you decide that your government, your administration, would begin the tax reform with value added tax? Well, the first thing I want to say is that governments over the last 20 years have recognized that we are not going to be able to develop our country hmm. in the traditional sources of revenue that we had, and that we had to find a new form of taxation. A lot of people weighed in as to what form of revenue or what form of taxation we should adopt. So f the first thing my government did was committed itself to taxation reform. We then looked at consultancies that were done. Hmm. Firstly, by the Crown agents who concluded that value added tax was the way to go. The International Monetary Fund who concluded that value added tax was the way to go. And the last one was which was the Inter-American Development Bank who came up with a model. After we found out all of those agencies hmm. argued for value added tax, the taxation or coalition for taxation reform in the Bahamas started advocating payroll taxes. Yes. So what my government did was they said, listen, we want the best for the Bahamas. Let us work with the business community. Mm. Let us give them an opportunity to come forward with a reasoned position on it. And so they went out, they hired consultants. We hired an, a, an American firm ourselves. And together, the coalition for taxation reform, their the opinion that they arrived at through their consultancy was that value added tax was the order of the day. But now, what we de then did mm -hmm. was what amount should we come up with? Yes. We brought consultants in from New, Ge from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. New Zealand is probably the one country that is a model for countries that have used value added tax. They came in, they argued that it was fair, they gave us a structure, they said we should minimize the exemptions to this mm -hmm. and go straight, make it simple or simplify it, and we came in at seven and a half percent. And what we said was, as we engage on January 1st, um, which was yesterday, we would also reduce customs duties. Because again, the idea is there should be a balanced approach to taxation. And we're reducing now about 100 items, um, and items that impact people in their cost of living, mm. like clothing, like building supplies, like different foodstuffs. And so we're, we're hoping that moving forward, the level of flexibility we have shown, right up to today, the Ministry of Finance is meeting with gas, the gas station operators, yes. mm -hmm. fuel providers, with a view to listening to their case, presenting our position, and being able to iron out all of the difficulties that they face. Prime Minister, value added tax, we know it is something that uh, was suggested, as you said rightly, by the IMF, the IDB, um, so forth. This may be a good thing as far as you're concerned, but uh, did your government consider the idea of value added tax in a company with the income tax. I know you heard this question before and it's an old question, but it's worth uh, repeating to, to, for the, our listeners tonight to understand exactly why you decided that, it, when I say you, your government, decided that value added tax was the way to go with when you could compare that people are saying, well, this is not an equal tax. I mean, if there was, there, if there was a, uh, an income tax, along with value added tax, like it is done in many other countries, more than 100 countries do this, uh, then why didn't we do it that way as well? No, we had to decide, firstly, we were coming out of a recession. Yes. We were mm -hmm. faced with a situation where unemployment was sky high. For young people, well over 20%. The average unemployment is around 18%. So we knew we could not put the economy into further shock. And we had to come up, based on advice, with what would be the fairest tax 
and that would give us an opportunity to raise the income we needed to develop the Bahamas, and we decided that it would be the value-added tax. We thought that adding income tax to it would just place us, the economy into a shock and, and create another recession. Hmm. So we, we really got advice from all sorts of different sources that enabled us to strengthen our resolve to make it um, the value-added tax as the case might be. And what we decided was, given the arguments that will impact the poor, when we examined exemptions, we realized that we must be careful with that because when you provide exemptions in, to food stores and food stuff, the mm -hmm. rich benefit even more. And so <clears throat> what we thought we would do is parallel with the introduction is to have a very dynamic involvement of our social services to offset the impact of that on prices. Mm -hmm. So in addition to reducing um, customs duties and therefore impacting prices that way, um, we also have a new program that we are introducing in social services that really should be able to offset, minimize the impact, mm. the negative impact um, of the new costs on people who are the most disadvantaged. This is the very country. beginning. At right at the beginning, uh -huh. right now. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have prepared for it. Um, we have planned for this day. Um, we know that except for the growing pains of introducing a new tax, the flexibility we have had, one that we're, we're not standing fast and firm, we're prepared to listen to all of the stakeholders, hear what their arguments are, like for example, lawyers, accountants, even gas station um, people importing gas. Mm -hmm. They came to us and said, listen, we cannot pay taxes up front. Let us pay as we make money. Let us pay as we sell. We so you're working fine. it. And we're yeah. working with you, mm -hmm. and we will do that. And so that's, we, we find that we've been able to arrive with the satisfaction of a lot, a significant part of the economy and the right balance and the right approach to this. And so mm -hmm. right now, it's going on, it's on. We believe that in years to come, Bahamians will see that this was the new paradigm in taxation Understood. that enabled us to jump the economy forward. Prime Minister, I know that is the plan, that is the vision, and that's good. People, though, believe that you've started out at 7.5%. Barbados wanted to start it. They started out at 15%. They ended up at 17%. How soon, or is there any plan? Are there plans for this to happen at about 15% in the next year, year or two, See, next six months? I, I, I hope not. Hmm. Let, let, let me put it. One has to be very careful when one is talking about taxation. But James Smith articulated very early on, he's a consultant, a former minister in my government, mm -hmm. and he articulated that he thought, taking everything in consideration, it ought to be 7.5%. The New Zealanders came in and they said maybe 10%, but we said no, 7.5%. Now, what we're going to do is this. We could have made the decision to decrease customs duties even more significantly than we're doing now mm -hmm. to make it easier for the Bahamian public. But we now know our budget year starts in July of next yes. year. Mm -hmm. The budget will go to Parliament in May of next year. Mm -hmm. So we're going to watch the next several months very closely because the idea is this, that in addition to bring, give, charging 7.5%, the idea is to it have further reduction of customs duties. And so, but we want to be careful as we're introducing this for the first time that we take a rational and sensible approach to the taxation model that we've now adopted. And therefore, you're going to find that, listen, we know the pain that people go through. We know what is necessary for businesses to survive. We believe we have laid the basis of a big jump forward in our economy. Mm -hmm. The International Monetary Fund estimates that our economy will grow by 2.1% next year. I want it to grow more because I don't think they know and have a feel for the kind of dynamic development that is on the books and that we're processing, some of which will come into being in 2015. Prime Minister, let us talk about that then. Let us look at the economy. We've been hearing a whole lot that, especially with the Ministry of Finance, that we are beginning to turn, to see the turn of the economy. A lot of people say they can't feel that. How do you speak to the economy from a point of view that there is promise within this particular year, this fiscal year, especially for your government, that there's promise that the economy is going to uh, pan out some more when you look at the fact that 
we have value added tax that a lot of people are still grumbling about. They're, they're, it's going to take a, lot, a while for them to get used to it. How do you now come and say to us as the Minister of Finance, substantially, that we're going to see the kind of growth in this economy that's going to propel this country to a level that we can put a smile on our faces? Well, Steve, I happen to be the Minister for Investments, so to speak, as mm. Prime Minister. Investments is in my portfolio. Therefore, we process investments. And what we're seeing, for example, is we know by the end of March, uh, some 5,000 new persons will be employed by Bahama. That in itself will trigger Not, not eight, 5,000. At, le at least 5,000. At least 5,000. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, Atlantis has about 8,000 people working. There, there's a, another hotel there now. Mm -hmm. So by the time they get going, they, you're talking about 5,000 new jobs. And people are being employed now there. So we know there's going to be a significant impact there. The Hilton Hotel, for New Providence, the Hilton Hotel, for example, is going to go through a dynamic redevelopment, almost making it the gateway to the city of Nassau. Smaller hotels on that strip are now mm. being redeveloped yes. there. Um, the, we expect the South Ocean to come in shortly with a new purchaser. Lyford Key has agreed now, and we've approved their development to expand at Lyford Key. A new office block, new cottages, new condominiums. Yeah. Albany continues with their dynamic development, hiring hundreds of, of construction workers. So we know it's happening. Now, when we go to Bimini, and we see the development in Bimini, we know, for example, 200 additional hotel rooms will come on stream in mid-January mm -hmm. in Bimini, another 300 jobs in Bimini. So we're talking about 800 to 1,000 new jobs in Bimini as a result of the Genting development in Bimini. We go to Apico. We now know that Winding Bay has joined Baker's Bay. Baker's Bay has $350 million worth of construction going on. It's a dynamic development. So there's great expansion expected. It's really expansion. Mm -hmm. Now we have a new purchaser who has come into Winding Bay. They're cleaning it up, brushing it off, and we expect dynamic impact. Schooner Bay, another development there going on. We're about to build an, a, a new harbor in North Abaco um, that we inherited from the Ingram government. So mm -hmm. again, you can see with the, um, that with plans possibly for the extension of the runway and Marsh Harbor, we, with the new terminal building, we have dynamic, fundamentally sound um, business opportunities developing and entrepreneurial opportunities. We go to Grand Bahama. The minister has indicated that tourism in Grand Bahama has grown by some 37 percent as a result of this company Sunwing coming out of, of Canada. And Sunwing now taking the old Reef Hotel and making it a Memories Hotel. Hmm. That alone will not do for Grand Bahama. So we have, when we negotiated a rollback of taxes, I di had discussions with Hutchison Wampour, um, MSC, uh, Mediterranean um, Shipping, shipping yeah. um, mm -hmm. and, and also the Grand Bahama Port Authority. And they said the taxes were difficult for them in Freeport. I said, what would you do if we roll the taxes back? We roll the taxes back. They agreed to expand the container port. They agreed to consolidate, expand in pharmaceutical, expand. And so what is happening is that we have, again, very interesting developments, positive developments in Grand Bahama. And I think what I can say is we are on the verge of a major development in East Grand Bahama. So these, these, are, gonna, these are going to prime minister this right create, create in, this jobs. Is, this is 2015 creating jobs right in, in Grand, Grand Bahama. Bahama. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's just hear me now. And we think we're going to have a $200 million development in a part of Grand Bahama. And in China, we're meeting with major developers with respect to West End. So I really feel good about what's happening. We're mm -hmm. negotiating. We just writ wrote today to Hutchison Mampo saying that we will join them in negotiations to realign the Lucayan Beach Hotel and the Lighthouse Hotel and bring that back into being. So we have dynamic involvement going on there. Now, let me tell you something, right? Take Andros. Andros is sitting there right offshore New Providence. No one has been looking at it. I made a speech and said, in this term, we're going to put $100 million in infrastructure into Andros. Yeah. And why did I do the it? Project. Andros has 43% of the land mass of our country. 2,300 square miles of land, Andros. Yes. Andros only has a population of 10,000. And 80% of the economy of Andros is through its natural resources. And that is 50% of it through sponging and crabbing mm. and, and commercial fishing. 
The other 30% of it through tourism-related fly fishing because we have the most outstanding fly fishing opportunities in the world, the flats of Andros, the third barrier reef, an ecological wonder. And in another three weeks or so, we're going to be bringing into Andros a $600,000 IDB-sponsored survey, right? survey mm -hmm. to, to create, I think, opportunities for Bahamians. We're going to identify economic opportunities for Bahamians that would not compromise on the environment of Andrus. So how do you best do sponging? How do you best do fly fishing? And, you know, and, and so I am very excited. And then, of course, we have BAMSI. BAMSI was put there mm -hmm. to lay the basis, now not just talk, of for the first real opportunity at diversification of the economy. And it's based on the fact that we import over $1 billion annually of foodstuffs. Yes. BAMSI is going to lead the way mm. in inspiring younger Bahamians to get involved in agricultural activity and in fishing activity. And you listen to this. I just told you that 80% of the economy is based on natural resources. 1% is agriculture. One <laughs> percent is agriculture. Prime Minister, we're going to talk more about that when we come back here this evening. Not only that, are we going to talk about more on BAMSI and agriculture and the, and the beautiful opportunities that this country will be presented with, but certainly, Prime Minister, we're going to talk about some banking, the financial services sector, and of course, the BOB matter, the Bank of the Bahamas matter, as well as that of Mr. Ryan Pinder. These are things that people are very concerned about, and tonight, when we continue our interview with the state of affairs of the country, we shall ask the Prime Minister some of those questions after these words. Welcome back to our program tonight. We're talking and sitting with the Prime Minister of the country, the Right Honourable Prime Minister, Harry Gladstone Christie. Tonight we're taking a look at the state of affairs of our country. And of course, there are many plans, as you heard the Prime Minister say in the first segment, many things on the drawing board for 2015 and beyond. And while that is so, we have to take a look back at 2014 to look at some of the things that had taken place there. Prime Minister, of course, we looked at the whole matter of Bank of the Bahamas. Let's talk about that for a minute if we can. That and the Ryan Pinder matter. The Bank of the Bahamas, of course, this government, uh, the people of the Bahamas, has a 65% stake in Bank of the Bahamas. I took it that uh, when I saw recently you making a statement that uh, all things were not as beautiful as you would have liked them to be, as the man in charge of the country and of course the man in charge of the finance. And so you went down there to the, um, to the central bank to have a talk and you made a statement subsequent. You talked about a number of things that are supposed to happen. You look at that bank being solvent. You looked at this whole matter of Resolve Bahamas coming up with, uh, to take care of this $100 million deficit. Where are we? You had made mention, Prime Minister, that at the end of the year, there should have been some changes made to the point where the membership of Bank of the, not the membership, but the management of Bank of the Bahamas would have had some new leadership. How is that going? Where, where are we with BOB? What I, what I indicated to the board mm -hmm. in a press conference when we spoke about resolve and the creation of resolve was that I would warn them by the end of the year to advise the government on a plan moving forward. And what has happened is that the managing director, Mr. Paul McQueenie, has now given formal notice of an intention his resignation notice. Mm. And it's a six month notice that you give the bank. The bank is really now in the process of recruiting um, new leadership for the bank. And so that's the process that you can expect to happen. But at the same time, the bank um, has asked Mr. McQueenie to provide a plan going forward. Mm. That plan was just submitted last week um, to the board of directors and we expect the Ministry of Finance to receive a copy of it. But the idea of the plan is to show how the bank could move to profitability. Um, let me just say that the Bank of Nova Scotia and other banks have had tremendous difficulties um, in this region and worldwide. And they're evidenced by the fact that they've laid off people, they've closed yes. down mm -hmm. banks, etc. Mm -hmm. So the Bank of Bahamas being no exception. But we are satisfied that as a 65% a shareholder, that there is a way forward that the bank can adopt. We are satisfied that we are on the way to that. And to do that and to make that possible, we formed the company Resolve and took $100 million of bad debt 
so to speak. And I say bad debt only in this sense, that it was important for the bank to meet the requirements of the central bank, and therefore it was important for that decision to be made. Mm -hmm. We have since formed a board of directors of Resolve, with James Smith as the chair, and other distinguished Bahamians on that board of directors, and we've hired the firm um, Deloitte um, and Touche mm -hmm. to manage the process. And so we expect, therefore, that we're going to have positive results from Resolve, and in fact, we already know that a significant sale of one of the assets has taken place, mm -hmm. which has funded Resolve substantially to mm -hmm. move forward um, and sort of, so to speak, lay the basis of success going forward. So I'm very optimistic mm -hmm. that that was the right decision and that it will be proven and seen to be the right decision. With respect to the Bank of the Bahamas, the government always has the option to sell shares. Um, we just do not want to be bludgeoned into doing it. People who bring negative news, we want to be able to do this in the fullness of our considering what is best for the country, what is best for the Bank of the Bahamas. And so we are confident that we are on the move. We are confident that the right decisions are being made. And we expect in short order for there to be new management direction. Prime Minister, not only did we have some difficulties and challenges with the Bank of the Bahamas, as you rightly put it, there was a bailout, of course. That's what it, it results in, the bailout, the uh, making sure that the books were, were looking much better for any new incomers uh, who want to be a part of the Bank of the Bahamas. Uh, with the resolve Bahamas taking over that bad debt. Apart from that, though, Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, are you concerned that we have a number of financial institutions who have, in fact, been laying people off, have been sending their work basically overseas, and uh, not only that, uh, even the portfolio of a major bank, a major player like Royal Bank of Canada, uh, with their wealth management going someplace else out of the jurisdiction of the entire Caribbean. I'm wondering how concerned are you with that as far as Bahamas are concerned with jobs going elsewhere? We are very concerned, <coughs> but I should say that mm. we continue to have meetings with the banks, and therefore we've developed a good relationship, and one in which where we understand the great difficulties. The, there has been a significant negative impact of mortgages in the Bahamas. And you remember when we first came to power, we had a mortgage relief program yes. um, that we thought the banks had Is that had still something you're going to be doing? And we've recalibrated. And just today, we've had some final meetings mm -hmm. on that where we're dealing with a specific lead bank on this matter. It is an enormous problem for the country yes. because there are people who are in homes, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense for the bank to put them out because their homes will be vandalized, but who are not paying mortgages, and some of them are not paying mortgages because they don't have any jobs, and, and they can't. There are others who have jobs and who are not paying mortgages for whatever reason that has to be dealt with, and there are some who have now jobs, but the, in losing the jobs months, a year, two years ago, that the interests have built an extraordinary amount and it's very difficult for them to meet the payments. So the government has been meeting with a particular lead bank to discuss a new formula. I'm really happy with this because um, I got tired of people coming to me saying they're losing their homes, their parents or their children have guaranteed the loan and they may lose their assets. And so I, I can say to you that we're working on a formula that will be an innovation um, where both the government and the banks will have to take a hit in this regard, mm -hmm. but it will come, it will all go well, I think, for the country um, because it has been an extraordinary challenge to the banks and the banks, um, um, they, they need the kind of relief we're talking about and the kind of direction that we're talking about. And this is in the context of their continuing to do business in the Bahamas. Um, it, it is something that we have to be mindful of. The world has changed globally in terms of know your customer rules and all of the conditions that have yes. evolved in terms mm -hmm. of banks. And so the, the future of the Bahamas um, looks good. We just have to continue to work with what we have. Do I hear you though, Prime Minister, saying that um, your government will take another look at the mortgage relief plan substantively to the point where you're working in partnership with a lead bank that you've not named. I will let you go on that for today, but I'm sure that you're going to make an announcement at some time soon. But uh, that this is going to be the remedy going forward, hopefully, for a lot of those persons who have 
our mortgages that are in, I, in jeopardy. I, I think so. I think it mm -hmm. is fair for me to say that <coughs> I will soon be in a position to go to my colleagues in government with a formula that would be a shared approach mm -hmm. to the challenge. And yes, it will constitute a major intervention um, and that it will, in fact, impact positively people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those naysayers who, who spoke about what Christie could do or can't do, who said I couldn't negotiate a 2% buyback from, you know... From BDC? You know, <laughs> you know BDC. I mean, you know, you, mm -hmm. at some stage or the other, you're going to have to give credit to my government, and quite frankly, you're going to have to give credit to me. Um, because, you know, I've been around for a long time, as you'd appreciate, and therefore, I think I understand governance, I understand what is necessary, Necessary and the most, the, what you cannot challenge me on is that I'm connected to people and their needs. And therefore, my heart will always drive me nonstop to find a formula that will be in the best interest of a, 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 lot, a lot of people who now need mortgage relief. I appreciate that, Prime Minister. Having said that, uh, you have also been bandied about. Uh, what is Christie doing with this whole matter with Mr. Ryan Pinder? that Mr. Ryan Pinder would have caught Mr. Christie off guard with the resignation. Um, this is what is being said. And that um, Christie, uh, where he should have fired him, he didn't fire him. And uh, we're wondering, sir, what is the position? I mean, I know what your statement was. We read the statement from the Bahamas Information Services that said that you had been having conversations and you were on top of things with this whole a bit of the uh, resignation. But it did come off pretty much as if it was a surprise to the Bahamian people and that um, that we did not know about it. How do you speak to that from a context of it was so, it wasn't so, and how do you defend your position that you knew, but um, it still seems no, as if no. I, I, I that you didn't get to name anybody immediately after, after uh, the resignation? No, I think I should say that when I was advised mm. of Ryan's intention to resign, I was surprised because Ryan had great potential I always described him as someone who was white but could lead a black party. That's <laughs> how I saw the energy, yeah. the capacity, Understood. the empathy with people, etc. Mm. I saw that in him. And the one thing that I think I should try to distinguish, the former prime minister spoke about levels of hypocrisy. The difference between Ryan and Vince Van Der Poel Wallace is Vince Van Der Poel Wallace had the Hotel Corporation. The Hotel Corporation ceded 2,500 acres of land and Vince became the consultant thereafter. Now, it is what it is. You know, I, that, we took some positions, we took public positions on it. Ryan Pinder is in a promotional ministry, not a regular, regulatory ministry, promotional. So yes, one can argue he saw an advantage for himself that people got to see that he was of immense ability, that he had credibility internationally, and therefore he may have parlayed that into a new job. Mm. The fact of the matter is that once he decided to do it, I accept it that in today's Bahamas, there are ministers who I have who are challenged economically and who, when opportunities come along, may accept the opportunity to do better for their families. That's something you cannot avoid. I'm not expecting everyone to be like me, giving a life in totality mm. to public service. So in Ryan's case, I, have no, I had no difficulty of accepting. What I asked him to do for me was because he was so accomplished in this area, is to write a transition paper for me mm. for his replacement. I have invited his replacement to accept, and that person has accepted. Um, the Ryan stayed until the 31st of December, and that person has accepted. And so you will know momentarily as we sit here um, that preparations are being made for the announcement as to who will succeed him and what other changes that I will make being made. So mm -hmm. I don't have a difficulty with the process that it was initiated once he resigned. I wish him well, and I think the more we can have people who know about public service working in the private sector, especially if they're PLPs, because I've had this argument before mm -hmm. that when I look at board of directors, I have to ask some of the banks whether they feel only F&Ms could be directors of these corporations. <laughs> and no, I, that's the kind of discussion I have had. Mm. Because again, to ensure that we have a balanced and orderly growth in our economy and that people who are worthy of selection to these positions are given that opportunity. So, you know, we will bring an end to the Ryan Pinder story. The one 
wonderful thing about it is he will continue in Parliament as a backbencher, and because he's an accomplished person and he, knew, he knows government policy, he will have a major impact on debates in Parliament. So he's not going any place. And so, you know, I wish him well now as we move on. But uh, we open a new page now moving forward in 2015. Talk about 2015, new page going forward. Everybody has in their mind that since Mr. Pinder has gone and Mr. Christie will now have to find a replacement, which Mr. Christie I, I, has found, which he's now found. He's not told us yet, but uh, we we expect that we'll know before this interview is over. But the thing is, now that Mr. Christie has done that, are there any other substantial changes that may be made to the Christie's uh, government and cabinet in any uh, major areas that uh, you may want to? Um, cue me in on now, as far well, as I, I think it's fair to say that mm -hmm. that there will be one or two changes. Um, all calculated to improve governance, um, exposing other people, younger p people as well, um, to governance, and you will find that we are, it's imminent in terms of the announcement in, in that regard. We waited for this moment to do that. And so w we're satisfied going into 2015 that we're going to have an effective team, and that, that team will have a lot to deal with. You know, I started to talk to you about the Bahamas, but people who, who live in places like Eleuthera and Exuma become concerned when I stopped at Andros, you know, because there's in so Eleuthera there's things. dynamic development. Mm. In Exuma, my goodness me, I, I, I can't articulate the impact that Exuma um, um, will have on the economy of the Bahamas when you're talking about positive impact. So in Eleuthera, Exuma, these things are set in. San Salvador, Club Med, Cat Island, you know, resort developments are all in place, about to happen, big movements in 2015. And so I don't have to, to concern myself um, by only saying this, that I am very optimistic. Before I used to be cautiously optimistic, <laughs> I am now very optimistic well, that we are now mm -hmm. turned the corner and we're headed to great things in our country. And, 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 and that's what's important. And even in places like Miguana and the Southern Bahamas, we are engaged in work that is all calculated to cause their economies to be improved. And during the year 2015, I expect it to manifest itself in, a, in special ways. But, but I think, you know, when we speak about this, I must say to the Bahamian people, the Minister of Transport presents a paper to her colleagues that it will take about $148 million to bring airports in the Bahamas. We have about 28 we manage up to standard. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of conditions because with the new kinds of ICAO requirements, international civil aviation requirements, wherever people go, you must have anti-terrorist instruments, and, you know, so yeah. more security, more, more machines, m more, you know, buildings better prepared. And, and from our point of view, um, we're talking about like an Exuma, where you could land in Exuma and see an Air Canada and Delta flight with hundreds of people landing or taking off at any given time down there. And now we are faced with one of the hotels saying they want to add immediately 200 rooms, a minimum of 200 rooms. And so that's, that's why I'm saying that in our country, we have this wonderful opportunity as the closest offshore country to the largest economy in the world to do much better much, much better than what the country has traditionally done. And, and I think the focus that most certainly I have as a leader, right, take, makes me independent of all the political talk out there about that. Talk that is trivial mm -hmm. compared to the overall... What is happening. Yeah, uh, and uh, what is happening. Understood. And the fact that my job is to say to Bahamians, I'm hearing daily from some of the world's leading corporate citizens who have decided to adopt the Bahamas as their home, how much they love the Bahamas, how much their children love the Bahamas. And I want Bahamians to have the same kind of feeling about their country and to manifest it so that when these, this ma band of criminal, criminals who exist in our country go about doing work that could cause advisories against people coming here, yeah. right? We have to have stakeholders, citizens, who are prepared to find this uh, repugnant and abhorrent and, and, and go out of their way to make sure that they do their part in stopping this madness that is happening in this country. Prime Minister, you said a mouthful, and on that, um, you look at the area of what you've been talking about just now. These uh, have been the three major 
concerns for the Bahamas, the economy, immigration, and crime. You touched on crime. Let's talk a little bit more about crime from the point of view as to what's the focus. I know the government has done, and successive governments have done, uh, many things to try to bring this uh, crime under control to a point. But this also needs some basic human intervention as far as neighbors and everything is concerned. I know that. I'm asking you, though, as the leader, you're the man in charge of this country, what do you really hope to have happen um, in the, in the sh immediate, short-term, long-term, as far as the, 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 the combating of crime, to, to stomp it out, to get it down to a manageable level, I suppose, where we don't have bulletins from the Americans or the Canadians or people putting out these kinds of information saying be careful when you go to the Bahamas. What would you like to see really happen and how can we achieve that? Well, f firstly, I, I want to, to say that the challenge for us is right here in New Providence. Mm. And that even though one can argue that we have improvement in crime statistics in terms of killings, all right, it is just a horrible kind of existence yes. out there. Killing fields. We know, for example, that a lot of it is done by people who have been let out on bail. And we do know the constitutional requirements to have people tried within a period of three years. And that if you cannot try them within three years. Now, the, the numbers have grown so high, it became difficult. So my government decided, and it should be implemented this month, to put 10 courts into existence at the same time, to amend the, the laws for jury selection to enable jurors to be even come as far from the islands, but to put the judicial system in a position where it can now remain current with, with criminals and crime mm -hmm. and charging people and having trials done. At the same time, we know that we have to continue to introduce new strategies. Now, I've just recently said that some of them I can't really speak about in detail, but I'll tell you this. I really hope that the Commissioner of Police and his colleagues come to understand that the political directorate has a stake in what is taking place. That just as I blamed the FNM, all right, and maybe unwisely, but as I blame them, I take it that I have an obligation to the Bahamian people to provide a solution because I advocated it. Mm -hmm. I have given the police officers, as a Minister of Finance, over 200 new officers since we came into power. We have classes in existence, so I'm adding to that amount. I want to ensure that we do not fail in being able to smother the crime and criminal activity because we don't have sufficient men. We have given them equipment. We have given them technology. We just agreed for 12 buses, for example, to be able to make them even more mobile on this island mm -hmm. because we are determined not to compromise our effort to do it. I said something called saturation patrols. And by that I meant where the permanent placement in communities that are hot spots in there, where people do not move, you only could add to them. So I don't want to hear continued killings in my constituency, um, in Strawn's Corner or in Thompson Lane or mm -hmm. Gibbs Corner. I don't want that. I want to be able to give the people who live in there the certain knowledge that we have full coverage in those areas. Understood. So that's what saturation means. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so I'm satisfied as we begin to have further talks um, that we are on our way towards that. We have also created something that has been people, some people have been critical of, a national intelligence agency. NIA. All right? Mm -hmm. Legislation will be presented to Parliament when we go back um, in January to pass that into law, to make it accountable, etc. But this is now a super intelligence agency that is calculated to ensure that we understand what is taking place and at a high level they can share with the Americans, for example, mm -hmm. right, um, levels of intelligence that are specific to criminal interests and activity. Mm -hmm. And so we are happy about that. I have activated something called the National Security Council. We have draft legislation. I'm not sure yet whether we're going to legislate on it, but it, it's in existence where the Prime Minister chairs this meeting mm -hmm. with all of the armed forces and military forces lined up, defense force, police force, um, on that immigration customs, and where um, I am able to put 
certain cabinet ministers and some civilians. But again, this is all with a view now to bringing focus on the issues out there. My final point is this. You're going to find that we are going to be much more aggressive in integrating urban renewal, this holistic approach to it, into this crime mix. And I'm hoping that the budget will allow me the opportunity to be able to take a significant number of young men in particular who are not employed, who are almost in many instances unemployable, mm. but, right, in terms of their indifference, and to be able to not conscript them, but to invite them and their parents to place them in our, uh, under our influence a form of voluntary national service, mm -hmm. but to have the resources dedicated to making that happen. We have to do that, and we have to, to place an obligation and a challenge, really, to young people out there. Listen, if you're not working, we're going to find some activity for you. It's all geared to, to get you into wholesome activity, to give you training that you don't have, but to make you a more disciplined citizen of our country. Prime Minister, before I run to the break, you made mention earlier about your concern with the amount of persons on bail. And I know that's a funny and a pecul pe peculiar area because the lawyers, your lawyer, mm -hmm. you would know that uh, there are certain constitutional rights that people have. And we are all really confused and confounded by the amount of people on bail. Um, is there any plan by for your government in this legislative agenda to take a look at, say, the Bail Act to take a look at making new legislation to mitigate against those persons who in fact may be granted bail um, or is it that you're just challenged to have the courts run in such a smooth way that uh, that will not be a cause of concern the bail at the, at the end of the day? We're not going to rule <coughs> any strategy out um, including legislative strategy but we want to make sense of what we're doing. Mm. We do know that it's a fair expectation that you'll be tried within three years and that we therefore must not compromise on giving the Attorney General the resources to bring that reality about that you are going to be tried within yes. three years and mm -hmm. therefore it doesn't rise. We expect though the justices to be aware of this new development in our country where people who are let out on bail become victims and are killed or they kill and that the statistics now will bear out that to be a Absolutely. major, major concern. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that I am sure that they would be, be appreciative of that. Now, I don't want to practice law here, but the one thing I, I, I have asked them to, I would ask them to take into consideration is what ought a justice to do if in fact the statistics bear out yes. what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. That once you release this person, you're sending them to death or someone else to death. Yeah. That kind of reality is how constitutional changes take place. And therefore, I expect that, that as we move into this year, for, for the justices in our courts to be giving serious consideration to the social situation that exists in this country Absolutely. and the need for the entire country to compromise and come to grips with whatever we have to do to make this a better place for all because the people who kill are victims and the people who are killed are victims. Absolutely. And we have to come, I think, recognize that and do whatever we can to minimize it. The point I want to leave with all Bahamians though is that we have a, a burden placed on us to know that our economy as driven by tourism as to 70% of it, directly and indirectly. Mm -hmm. And that when countries like the United States of America and Canada put out advisories warning their people about where they could go and whether they should go someplace and because they would be affected by criminal activity, our Bahamians should know that once that happens and people start not coming to the Bahamas, it's difficult to get Absolutely. them back. No and so we have this obligation as we are putting strategies in place to communicate to our people the significance of their seeing themselves as protectors and guarantors of the security and safety, not just of our community, but of our country. Final point on the crime bit, Prime Minister. You look at all the things that we see. We all have a social obligation, as you rightly put it. What of the government having given reconsideration to the idea of National Youth Service in some form, 
because many people are now crying out for it. We have urban renewal, which is good in, in many of the uh, inner city areas, but what of a national plan of action that perhaps will do us good as a country to have national youth service? Is that something well, that I, you I, would consider? I, I, I should, saying this, given your question, concede that Penling was right. So Lyndon Penling was right mm -hmm. when he came up with the idea of thought, but um, the public opinion and pressure was too great at the time. Um, what I said to you earlier about looking for the means, the money um, from revenue gained in the country to be able to employ a number of men, young men who are dropouts. You know, young men at 15, 16 are put out of school. Mm -hmm. They can't behave in school. They're sent to urban renewal centers. And you wonder, what, well, what's happening? Where do they go? There's no plan to be able to get them um, trained, to expose them to um, sort of good citizenship habits and practices. And so what I'm talking about is before we move to the stage of thinking of national service conscription, where you have to do it, which might well be it, right? I'm trying to find now the revenue Understood. to absorb those persons who are unemployed now, who if you speak to them at the community level would want to work and to give them an opportunity to move them out of their environment and move them into places like Andros and Meguana, et cetera, in terms of organized employment activity where you get a stipend, where you might be under the supervision of the police or the defense force, but it is something that we have I'm actively considering now, and, and it really would mean that you graduate to, what, to where you're talking about it, okay. um, based on resources available to the country. But it's I, not off the table, is what you're saying? It's not off the it's table, off the but table. The, the point I want to make is that, you know, we cannot afford to allow our country to suffer because of the behavior of a few people, relatively speaking. And therefore, we must continue to work and involving more and more Bahamians into the process, getting their ideas and, and, and moving forward. And one of those ideas obviously has to be on how do we control the behavior of young people, both men and women, young boys and girls as they may be. And uh, the evidence we had when we had the Jeff Lloyd system um, under the Defense Force and Andros, all of the evidence pointed to it being very successful, mm. but also a very costly. Um, enterprise. And the real question for us is, can we afford not to do it? And with that, that's our program for tonight. But join me tomorrow night. We are coming back with more. There's more to come with the nation's chief executive, Prime Minister Christie. And I want to encourage you to be around for tomorrow night when we continue. Good night.